بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إلى السماء فطرت وإلى الكواكب انتثرت وإلى البحار فجرت وإلى البحار فجرت وإذا القبور بعثرت علمت نفس ما قدمت وأخرت يا أيها الإنسان ما غرك بربك الكريم فسواك فعذلك ما غرك بربك الكريم الذي خلقك فسواك فعذلك في أي صورة ما شاء بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد تفسير سورة الانفطار chapter 82 of the Quran الانفطار we can translate for now as tearing apart or cleaving asunder and this is a surah like the previous surahs we have looked at so far a surah which is Makkiyah Surah which was revealed in Mecca by agreement of, of scholars. And it is a surah which really completes the previous surah that we have looked at. Uh, we will notice a lot of similarities between this surah and the previous surah, although this surah is obviously shortens in, in length. Um, but we will touch upon a very important concept, uh, inshallah, about the matter of repetition in the Quran. This is something that many people ask about, um, that we find there are many verses that are repeated within the Qur'an and you know, people find it difficult to understand why this occurs. So we'll try and touch, touch upon that, uh, inshallah. Now this surah, so it, this surah, it will begin by discussing the, uh, the major things and events that will occur before the hour is established like in the previous surah and then it will go on to discuss man's ingratitude to his Lord and his failure to concede that the fact that the Day of Judgment will occur. The surah begins by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying إِذَا السَّمَاءُ فَطَرَتْ When the sky is torn apart or when the sky is uh, cleft Asunder. Now this phrase either we've spoken about it in great detail in the previous surah so I'm not going to um, spend too much time on it but just to remind ourselves that either is a word which denotes a, a, a shart and a jawab, a condition and a uh, response. When such and such happens then there will be a jawab, a response. So in the last surah, we saw how the surah began with a lot of these idhas. Yeah, idha, idha, idha. It's a word that we say, which is mushawwiq. It, it, intent, it, it stimulates the person to hear a response. Like if I was to say to you, remember, if so-and-so comes and, and if he comes at this time and the situation is like this and the weather is like this your 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 eagerness to to learn the response grows and that's why in the previous surah um, there was this 
uh, elongation or a, a prolonging of the jawab in order to induce a type of eagerness. And this is what we said. Uh, does anyone remember the phrase? This is style of bala in, in Balagha, we call this? Itnab. Good, Ahsant. Itnab. Okay. <clears throat> now, here though, as we will see, inshallah, in this surah, the amount of idhas that are used are very few in comparison. Okay, so, idha sama'un fatarat, okay, wa idha al kawakibun tatharat, wa idha al jibalu, wa idha al biharu fujirat, wa idha al kuburu bu'athirat. That's it. Now, the difference here is. In terms of the order of the surahs that were revealed, we say Surah at takwir was revealed first. The previous surah okay, was revealed first, followed by uh, uh, Surah Al-Infitar. And many scholars, some scholars were of the view that there was a gap of uh, approximately 80, 82 surahs that was revealed between these two surahs. As you know, the, 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 the order of the Qur'an as we know it, this is not the chronological order, isn't it? We don't say Surah Al-Fatiha is the first Surah that was revealed, followed by Surah Al-Baqarah, followed by Surah Al-Imran. No, that's not the, 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 the organization, the tertiba of the Qur'an is not based upon that. And so Surah Al-Takweer was first revealed, okay, and there was a large gap in between. And so as a result, there is no real need to have this itnab. This, prolong, this prolonging of the use of idhas. Because that's already been achieved in Surah Al-Takweer. Okay, that's already been achieved in Surah Al-Takweer. So when a person hears this, uh, a person who's used to hearing Surah Al-Takweer, okay, he's used to hearing Surah Al-Takweer, he's heard it many years before, and then when he hears this now, this Surah, إِذَا السَّمَاءُ فطرت, Okay? وَإِذَا الْكَوَاكِبُ انتثر, and When he hears all of this, he more or less will know what the answer will be. So is there really a need for itnab, for prolonging the idhas and making more and more idhas? No, not really. Not really. Now, here, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions uh, four incidents. Okay, four incidents. Two that are related to the heavens and two that are related to um, the, the, the lower matters of the earth. So, when, this, when the sky it is torn apart or cleft asunder, and when, this, when the stars are essentially scattered, these are related to the heavenly matters. Okay? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the explosion of the seas and how people will be essentially thrown out of their graves. And these are all related to lowly matters. And this is a, a type of parallelism that we find within the Qur'an that occurs quite a lot. I mean, if we remember in Surah Taqweer, we said, remember, Allah mentioned six things that will happen before the hour is established and another, okay, six things that will happen after the hour is established. Likewise here, there's two things related to the Uwiyat, the higher matters, and then the Sufliyat, then the, the lower matters, two things. This is what we call in Arabic is diwaj type of izdiwaj, which can mean like pairing up, but it's to do with being a parallel mention of things. And this shows you really the intricate detail of the Qur'an, it's not just random uh, sayings. <coughs> so, إِذَا السَّمَاءُ إِنْ فطرت. When the sky in fatarat. Now, the word in fatarat originally is from the word fatara. Fatara. And fatara, we say, it means a shakku poolan. It literally means to tear something apart, but in terms of lengthwise. Now, the, the, the words we use in Arabic for cutting and piercing, there are many different words. There's words for cutting, words related to piercing, words related to tearing, there's in shiqaq as well. Okay? So, this word fatara means to, to, to rip something but longwise. So imagine lengthwise. Okay? And obviously, this is something which uh, in shiqaq or uh, in fitar, when, when two things were essentially 
part of the same structure and then someone made a tear all the way down the line. Okay? So imagine you had like a cloth, for example, and you, and you tore it all the way down. That is what we refer to as infitar. And this is where we get the word fitr, uh, al-iftar, or fitr. We have Eid al-fitr, and we have iftar, okay, when we break our fast. Why? Because you are in a state of fasting, then suddenly you have been stripped away from this state. So now you eat, okay? Now you eat, and that's why even breakfast, we call it futur, because... Why you spent the night in one state which was not eating? I mean, you don't eat in your sleep usually. <laughs> okay? So it's a sudden change. And likewise, we get the word fitra, natural disposition. Al fitra. And fitra, because uh, what does fitra mean? Is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates something, we say, ala hayatin mutarashiha li fi'lin min al afal. This is what. Maybe a, a good definition that Ar Raghib Asfahani gives in regards to fitra. Ijaduhu a shay ala hayatin mutarashiha li fi'lin min al afa'al. That this is where Allah He creates something in a manner which is mutarashiha, which has been reared up, you can say, or brought up in order to perform a certain action. This is what I mean by fitra. So, and what action is this? Okay, what action is this with relation to the creation of man? What does Allah reared man up to do? To worship him. So that's why we say fitra is his natural inclination. Okay, is his natural inclination. Now what's this got to do with splitting apart or, 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 or tearing? To understand this, let's look at another one of the names of Allah. What is, what is, what is the name of Allah that is connected to this word? Al-Fatir. Which we usually translate as what? The opener? No. The originator. The originator. The originator. Why? Because Allah, He makes something from nothing into something. He creates something which previously did not exist. Then all of a sudden he brought it into existence. It's like he's torn it out of non-existence and brought it into existence. In fitar. And that's why man doesn't have the ability to do that. I mean, he can create things from compounds, isn't it? He can make things from elements. But he can't make something from nothing. Only Allah, who is Al-Fatir, can do that. Al-Fatir can do that. That's a unique name to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in fitar, this is a, a severing and a tearing apart. Now notice here, in the previous surah, we've also spoken about the skies as well. وَإِذَا السَّمَاءُ In the previous surah, وَإِذَا السَّمَاءُ وَإِذَا السَّمَاءُ لا, previous surah, previous surah. Kushitat. Okay? And what did we say Kushitat meant? Okay, stripped. Okay. Right? Stripping apart, yeah. So it's as if it's been torn down, stripped down. Okay? Now, again, this is where the issue of repetition comes. So someone might look at this and think, oh, in the previous surah, Allah spoke about. You know, the, the tearing of the sky. But here is different. Now remember that we said that in the previous surah, Allah mentions two major stages. Things that will occur before the hour is established and that will occur after the hour is established. So wait, when we said, وَإِذَا السَّمَاءُ كُشِطَتْ Is that in the first half, first half or the second half? In the second half, yeah? وَإِذَا السَّمَاءُ كُشِطَتْ وَإِذَا الْجَحِيمُ سُعِرَتْ And that will obviously occur when the hellfire will be set ablaze. That will occur in the hereafter. In the, sorry, after the Qiyamah, after the, the Ba'ath, after everyone has been resurrected. Here though, when we're talking about the skies, we are talking about something else. We are talking before the Ba'ath itself, before the resurrection. So this is the, you could say, Allah preparing 
He is destroying the dunya into a different reality to prepare for the al ba'ath, to prepare the uh, resurrection. Okay, to prepare the resurrection. Now, um, just a quick note about um, uh, a quick note about this issue of repetition. Now, it is true in the Quran that we do find that there are a number of verses that have been repeated identically, but this is rare. Okay, there are some cases like this where there are a number of verses which have been repeated identically. However, there are concepts which have been repeated time and time again. Like the story of Musa, the story of Adam alayhi salam, obviously description of paradise and hellfire. And for someone who is not very familiar with the Quran, he might think that this is just repetition happening time and time again. And this is especially true for those who read the Quran in English, who read the English translation. Okay? But to answer this, we say, firstly, that a person who is in a position of tarbiyah, a person who is in a position of tarbiyah, of giving advice and nurturing and educating, then it's not enough to mention something once sometimes. I mean, those who have children, when you give them advice, you don't just give it to them once, isn't it? Sometimes you have to keep on repeating it to them. Mankind is always forgetful. You also have to remember that when the Quran was revealed, it was revealed over a period of 23 years. If I told you something 23 years ago, okay, many of you probably were even born then, but okay, imagine you, were, you lived a relatively long life, and I told you something 23 years ago, the chances are you'll probably forget, isn't it? So you need to be what constantly reminded. But even though, I mean, for a person who has the whole entire Quran in front of him, like this case, Surat al-Takweer, although Surat al-Takweer is probably revealed years before Surat al-Infitar, we are reading it right next to each other. So you might think, oh, there's this repetition. I just heard it a few minutes ago, so what's the benefit now? But we have already established what? That the context is different, isn't it? Even though the wordings are more or less the same. You know, al-Kushyatat and infatarat is a synonymous to a certain degree. But the context is different, isn't it? What's the context? One is about before the, the, the Ba'ath is established, and one is after the Ba'ath is established. And this is what we refer to as a, 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 a tanawur al-fanni. This is like a very diverse way of Allah explaining one thing. And this is a beauty. And in fact, one of the things that really interests a lot of scholars of Quran, of tafsir, is when they see verses that are similar in wording. Because they know there's a significant reason why there is a difference in the words that have been used. And in many cases, what they do is those verses that sound similar to one another, they help, they explain one another. And that's why one of the best methods of, of tafsir is by using what? The Quran itself. Tafsir Quran bil Quran. You have one verse, from one perspective, it might seem a bit vague, but there's another verse which is very similar in meaning, but slightly different words, and it explains beautifully the meaning of that aforementioned verse. And so therefore understanding the Qur'an becomes easier. Inshallah, I mean, I'm actually in the, in the process of writing a brief article on this because I know a lot of people have asked about it. So hopefully, inshallah, it will include more detail and more uh, examples, inshallah. Also, another important point here. In the previous verse, it said, and this will require for you to know some Arabic language. Okay, so I'm going to touch upon this point. Quite briefly. In the previous surah it says, وَإِذَا السَّمَاءُ كُشِيطَتْ Now, kushiyatat is a verb which we say مَبْنِيٌ لِلْمَجْهُولِ Where the verb is in the passive voice. Okay, so when the sky is stripped apart. Here, it's slightly different. Okay, وَإِذَا السَّمَاءُ إِذَا السَّمَاءُ انفطرت. انفطرت is on the pattern of infa'ala. It's on the pattern of infa'ala for those who've studied uh, as-sarf morphology. And in fatara, in, in, in fa'ala, it has a meaning of being passive. And in many cases, the dua, uh, uh, there, there, there is no real dua behind it. So, for example, there's a difference between saying futiha and in fataha. Okay, those who know a bit of Arabic, how do you, this is the problem in English. When we translate both words, what do they both translate as? 
Futiha. What does Futiha mean? Huh? To be opened. It was opened. What does in, in Fataha mean? It, it was opened. Okay? Now, in English they sound the same, but there's a, there's a significant difference. Because if I said Futiha al Bab, the door was opened. You expect to see someone behind the door. The door was open, and behold, there was somebody there. Okay? When you say in Fatah al Bab, the door was opened, but there's not necessarily anybody there. You know, this might be a breeze and the door just opens, yeah? In Fatah al Bab. So here, there's a similar thing happening. In the previous surah, the, the sky is, the sky is uh, stripped. And that's in the majhul form, like saying the door was open, Futiha. Okay? Here, though, it's on the pattern of infa'ala. Okay? So this implies you might think that the sky is going to be cleft asunder, is going to be ripped apart, but the dua is not necessarily there. But then Allah will respond to this. And this is amazing. That you might think that, therefore, this is all happening by itself. This is all happening by itself, but then, as we will see, inshallah, this is not happening by itself. This is all happening by the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So really people who think that there's just blatant repetitions in the Quran in it is because of their lack of knowledge. And when you really have knowledge of it, and this is why it's so important really to appreciate the beauty of the Quran and to understand why certain verses have been repeated, you need to have knowledge of the Arabic language. It's as simple as that. Okay, moving on. I think I spent too long on that one. <coughs> okay, so... Uh, <clears throat> now we said that the the cleaving of the, the 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 sky here and the ripping apart of the sky is something which will happen before the hour is established, before the resurrection itself. There's a verse which kind of indicates to that meaning, which is Surah Al-Furqan, verse 25. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Yawma tashakku al-sama'u bil-ghamami wa nuzil al-malaikatu tanzila." Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, on that day, the skies will be ripped apart with, uh, and with, with the clouds and the angels will descend. And why will they descend the angels? To fulfill the commandment of Allah to essentially change the, the entire universe. The angels will be involved in that process. So this is the first stage. And then the second changing of the heavens is what the, or the skies is what the eye and the previous surah, surah al-takweer, wa'idha sama'u kushitat, and when the skies is literally, uh, is being stripped down, because what will come next, wa'idha al-jahimu su'irat, wa'idha al-jannatu uzlifat, as if we're making a tear to allow the paradise to come. So the first stripping of, or the first uh, spitting of the sky, is to essentially begin the process of the destruction of the heavens and the earth. And the second changing of the skies is really to bring the paradise and to ablaze, set ablaze the hellfire. The idea that the purpose of all of this though, the purpose of all of this is to strike fear into the hearts of the listener. And what's the point of mentioning when the sky it, it is, you know, is cleft asunder? Now, we have to understand the Arabs at the time, they were very fond of the skies. <coughs> More than so in our time. Why? Because in our time, we can't really see the sky that much in its true beauty due to what? Light pollution. Like if you look up the sky, the sky now, you can barely see a star. Okay, but I'm sure those of you maybe come from villages or you know, Muslim countries, you know, when it's really dark, when the, you know, the, the, the beginning of the month or towards the end of the month, you see an amazing scene. And to the Arabs, that was something, you know, they, they would sing poetry about the stars, you know, they would use it for Wabid Najimi Hum Yahtadud, and they would seek guidance from the stars in terms of traveling. It was zina, it was a, a means of beautification. So this was something they would reflect on. And actually, if you live in a, in, in a desert, you live in that sort of environment, and you see the skies, it's something which is amazing. And all of a sudden you're told this is all going to be ripped apart. That truly will strike fear into your heart. But maybe it's not something that we can really reflect on that much. But really this is why I always advise that we should be in touch with nature. Really we should be in touch with nature. We should be people that love gazing at the, the stars, the planets, nature. You know, 
uh, in this day and age, we don't really get much of that. But still, we have means. You know, even pictures. Looking at pictures of of, of, of nature, of of the, of of these of the, of space and of the galaxies, it's just an amazing experience. Subhanallah. It really brings you closer to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And we have to understand that the sky to the Arabs was a means of protection. The sky to the Arabs was a means of protection. They, they saw how there's a sky above them that was built without any pillars. Remember the statement of Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, when he was asked about the verse in Surah Abasa, wa abba. What is Abba? Wa wa abba. And he's, what did he say? Remember? What sky will protect me? And what earth will hold me up? If I was to say about the words of Allah that which I do not know. So the sky was a means of protection for them. And but then they're told this sky will be cleft asunder. There is another interpretation that the infitar here, or another way of looking at this verse, the infitar or the splitting apart of the of the sky will occur due to the Haiba, the awe of the sky that it has for Allah on that day. That the skies itself will have so much awe of Allah, it will be cleft asunder. And so obviously this is an, a, a Makki surah, so it's directed towards the Mushrikeen. So if an inanimate object will cleave asunder from the Haiba of Allah, from the awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then surely your hearts must also cleave asunder from the fear of Allah. لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله. As well Allah says, we saw if this Quran was to be revealed on a mountain, surely it would have cleft asunder and split up due to the fear of Allah subhanahu wa taala. Some scholars connect this verse also to. Um, uh, the, the, in the in the previous surah we looked at one of the last few verses. Allah subhanahu wa taala says, "Fa'ayna tadhabun." So where are you going? What path are you going to take? If you're not going to be guided by this Quran, what path are you going to take? And it's as if this is a response. Ida sama un fatar. That you're going to have nowhere to go and the sky is going to be cleaved asunder. There's something which you, have so, you find so much protection in. It's going to be cleft asunder. Then the second verse. وَإِذَا الْكَوَاكِبُ انْتَثَرَتْ And when the stars are scattered and dispersed. And this is the second thing that Allah mentions. Obviously the connection between the stars and the skies is quite obvious. The stars, the st the stars, they reside in the heavens, in the skies. Now, in Tatharat, we in the previous surah, we also Allah Subhanahu wa Taala spoke about the planets, the Najm and Nujum, and the, uh, this, this, the, the the planets and the stars crushing down. In Tatharat here has a slightly different meaning. Now, in Tathara, we say it's the the tid or the opposite of al jama. When you bring things together, this is what we call al jama. The opposite of that is in Tathara, <coughs> to scatter. So when you have a lot of scattered objects, you bring them together. That's called jama. The opposite of that is when you have something gathered in one place and then it all drops. This is in Tathara. So for, for example, you have a necklace with a lot of beads. It's gathered together, okay, in one through one thread. If you cut that thread, what will happen to all the pearls? They will scatter. This is what we call in Tathara in the Arabic language. So this is to indicate that um, the, the stars, the stars, they were together. But were they really together? What would you mean? They, what do we mean by they were together? They were together by the system of gravity. As you know, gravity keeps everything together. Okay? And so this is to indicate that the planets which are close, relatively close to one another and they're being kept in this place due to, by gravity and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to destroy that system of gravity even, and it's amazing how even today no one truly understands even science can't really explain the, the, the reality of gravity and how it works. 
uh, that's all going to go. So that's everything is just going to fall apart. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moves on and he says, وَإِذَا الْبِحَارُ فُجِّرَتْ And when the seas, they are erupted and they burst forth. And the seas, الْبِحَارُ فُجِّرَتْ Now again, in the previous surah, we've looked at seas as well. But what did we, see, what did we say about the seas before in the previous surah? وَإِذَا الْبِحَارُ سُجِّرَتْ What does سُجِّرَتْ mean? Okay, yeah, that's what it's, it'll be set ablaze. That's that's one interpretation. It'll be set ablaze or it'll be overflown. Fujirat uh, from from the verb fajjara, this is uh, to explode. So here we mean the seas will be erupted and they will burst forth. Now notice here is gone is now this in this verse. It stopped following the pattern of infa'ala because in the first two verses there is in um, fatarat uh, and second verse in uh, tatharat. These are both following the patterns infa'ala, and we said infa'ala the dua then there doesn't necessarily have to be a dua there, but now it's gone to the passive voice fujirat, not infajarat. Fujirat. Now when we say fujirat is being exploded, but it's being exploded by a cause by somebody. So this is to repel any doubts so that if they might think, oh, you know, okay, the stars is just going to naturally all be destroyed. You know, even scientists believe that eventually this universe will one day come to an end. They predict it. But they believe it's all natural, isn't it? But this I is just to reiterate here, just a, a very slight indication that no, this is going to happen by an intelligible being. Now, uh, bursting forth, now, so, some scholars were of the view that uh, so the, 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 the seas will burst forth such that there will become only one sea on the planet. Others were of the view that the, 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 the water essentially will, will be thrown out of the ocean to the extent, it will burst forth to the extent that there will be no more water remaining in the sea itself. So it will just be empty land, essentially. And that was something which we spoke about in the uh, previous surah. Uh, because we said, remember, that according to one interpretation, the water will be turned into fuel for the fire. Because this, the seas will be set ablaze. And so eventually fuel will obviously eventually end. Verse 4, وَإِذَا And this is the last إِذَا which is mentioned in this surah. In this context, وَإِذَا الْقُبُورُ بُعْثِرَتْ And when the graves are uh, essentially turned inside out or overturned and the inhabitants are scattered out. Now this is almost explaining a, a, a verse in the previous surah. What verse in the previous in surah Taqweer has a connection with this verse? Hmm? What verse? Come on. When the earth is made flat. No, that's not mentioned in the previous one. <coughs> Source of Taqweer. <coughs> yeah. Why then Nufus was widget? No. When the um, the souls will be paired up. Now we said there are two inter two major interpretations. One was where people will be grouped up with their respective group, isn't it? So the people, the righteous, they will be grouped up with. The righteous and the evil doers, they'll be grouped with the evil doers. But what's the other, what was the other interpretation? What will be reunited with what? The souls of the body. Good. The soul will be reunited with the physical body. Now, this is essentially an explanation of that. In reality, we're saying that the, the, the souls, that the graves are going to be turned inside out. So, what's going to come out of these graves? Lifeless bodies? No. Human beings in the most perfect form. There won't be decayed, decomposed bodies. There will be bones. There will be bodies with bones, flesh and blood. So this, in a way, 
it's explaining that verse from a different angle. And this is why I believe that the, 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 the argument was very, very strong by the Mufassirin. That, that ayah in Surah Al-Takweer, where the nufus is al-wijad, refers to the soul pairing up with the, with the body itself. Um, and then, verse 5, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the jawab. When all of these things happen, so these two heavenly phenomena and these two earthly phenomena will happen. Alimat nafsun ma qaddamat wa akharat. Every soul shall know what it sent forth, qaddamat wa akharat, and what it kept back, or what it left undone. Now again, this is very similar to another surah in the uh, 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 similar to another uh, ayah in the previous surah. What was the other ayah in the previous surah? Alimat nafsun ma ahdarat. This ayah again, it's almost an explanation of that ayah. This is why we say there's no such real thing as pure repetition in the Quran. So what does it mean? Every soul will know what it brought forth. Well, this ayah is in a type of explanation to that. So what does this mean? Alimat nafsun ma qaddamat what it sent forth and what it kept behind. Now, there are a number of opinions. The first opinion, this is the opinion that Imam al tabari uh, rahimahullah, found to be the strongest opinion. Alimat nafsun qaddamat to send forward means this is when the person will know the consequences of his good deeds. وَمَا أَخَّرَتْ And that which was kept back. Now what does it mean to kept back? He says it refers to any good deeds, like sunnah actions that, that um, essentially were revived because of you. Okay? مَا أَخَّرَتْ مِنْ سُنَّةٍ يُعْمَلُ بِهَا بَعْدَ مَوْتِهِ So for example, imagine I died and I passed on this legacy of uh, for example, teaching some knowledge, and that knowledge gets passed down from generation to generation. This is what we call sadaqa jariya, isn't it? So, although I'm dead, this reward will keep on going. And that's something that I've left behind. This is something that I've left behind. So, both of these words, ma qaddamat wa akharat, indicates, it refers to the good deeds only. There's nothing about bad deeds here. Okay, there's nothing about bad deeds implied in, in, in this ayah. Ma qaddamat, in terms of good deeds. And this shows you really that a believer should be focused not just on the immediate good actions, but he should also try and invest in those actions that have a far-reaching consequence. Okay, so a believer should always be concerned about that. And this is a sign of someone who has very high aspirations. He doesn't just want to do something that will benefit just himself, he wants to do something that will benefit others around him, such that that will help him in his grave after he dies. He wants to leave an effect on the Muslim community, on the Muslim Ummah. That's the ideal Muslim. Another view is ma um, qaddamat, um, uh, refers to those obligations that he fulfilled. Wa ma akharat refers to essentially those obligations that he left out. And as a result, if you left out an obligation, you will be in sin. You will be in sin. So you have those obligations you left behind which you did not fulfill. You didn't fulfill them. And on that day, that is when the person will truly understand and recognize what he left behind. Or, as some said, and this is another view, a third view, um, Ma qaddamat refers to those good deeds that he sent forth. Wa ma akharat generally refers to the bad deeds that he done. So they're all, uh, especially the second and third, very similar in meaning. Uh, and the first uh, was the view of Imam al-Tabari, obviously, whose opinions are, you know, carry an extremely great weight. Everything we have mentioned so far. It's an almost, we can say, an introduction, a muqaddimah to the next verse. Unlike the previous surah. The previous surah, the first 12 verses essentially were to set up what verse? Alimat nafsun ma ahdarat. 
علمت نفس ما أحضرت. That was the heart of that surah, of of the surah, okay, of surah al-Takwir. Here though, علمت نفس ما قدمت وأخرت is not really the heart of the surah. Essentially, what what in this what we've studied so far is a summary of the previous surah. And that summary is serving as a muqaddimah, as an introduction to the next verse. And what is the next verse? Verse number six. Ya ayyuhal insanu ma gharraka bi rabbika al-kareem. O mankind, O human beings, O man, what has lured you away from your Lord the most generous? What has uh, deceived you about your Lord the most generous? first thing we can notice here is that there is iltifat taking place. Iltifat. A transition. Notice in the previous surah it didn't say alimtum ma qaddamtum wa ma akhartum. You will know. No, alimat nafsun. This is third person. This is third person. Ghaib. A person would know. Then all of a sudden, ya ayyuhal insan, ma gharraka. What has deceived you? about your Lord, the most generous. Now, the connection now between this introduction and this verse. Let's try and reflect upon this. One way of looking at this is Imam al-Biqa'i, rahimahullah, he said, لَمَّا كَانَ ذَلِكَ خَالِعًا لِلْقُلُوبِ All of this, this, this phenomenon that we've spoken about, the, the, the transformation of the skies, this is something which will really, like, make the heart alert. وَكَانَ الْإِنسَانُ إِذَا اَعْتَقَدَ الْبَحْثَ الْبَعْثَ And then after that he comes to his senses. No, there is now a resurrection. All these verses clearly, you know, instill that idea that there will be this resurrection. قَدْ يَقُولُ تَهَاوُنًا He could possibly say out of negligence, as a result of his sin, بِبَعْدِ الْمَعَاصِ Al-Marji'u ila Karimin. La yafa'alu bi illa khayran. He goes, okay, fine. There is this res resurrection, but at the end of the day, we're all going to turn back to the Karim, to the most merciful, and to the most generous. He will decide for us, you know, who was really good and bad. And our Lord is so Karim, He's so generous, He will only show good to us. He will only show good to us. So this is very similar to what happened in the previous surah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He cornered the people. فَأَيْنَ تَذْهَبُونَ Remember, he, there was an elimination process. Okay, so people who tried to accuse Jibreel alayhi salam, no, they couldn't accuse Jibreel because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him this tazkiyah, He gave tazkiyah to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So where are they going now? So now, they could produce another argument. Okay, fine. There is this uh, resurrection. We believe in it. Okay. But our Lord is very kareem. And this attitude we find amongst many Muslims today, isn't it? Yeah. Allahu ghafoor. Allahu rahim. I mean, they commit many sins. They say, Allah is rahim. Allah is merciful. <coughs> but this is amazing. Look, listen very carefully. Now, if you understand this context, ma gharraka bi rabbika al kareem. What has deceived you? Now, is this a gentle question? No, this is a su'al, this is a istifham. And what is it? Remember we said the Qur'an contains many questions. <coughs> and one of the purposes of, of, of questioning is, is for condemnation, inkar. And here is for ta'ajjub, amazement. What has deceived you about your Lord? Now, imagine here, okay? Imagine you're discussing or conversing with someone who rejects the... <coughs> The, the, the hereafter, and then you mention to them the terrors of the day of judgment. What name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be befitting after mentioning all of these descriptions? So we've talk, talk, we're speaking about these terrifying incidents, terrifying events, and then I said, what has made you heedless? What has deceived you about your Lord? You probably think maybe Al-Aziz, Al-Azim, the mighty one, the great one, is probably more suitable in this context. But Allah mentions the name Al-Kareem, which is amazing. 
Why? This seems to the superficial observer that this word, this name seems out of context, but no, it doesn't. Because if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just say hypothetically, imagine this verse read, Ma gharraka bi rabbikal aziz. What has delud deluded you and you know deceived you about your Lord the Almighty? What could their response be? They said, But our Lord is generous. Our Lord is generous. But Allah is negating that straight away without before they can even make an argument. What has deceived you about your Lord, the most generous? So you can't use any example as, as an argument that, well, Allah is generous with us. Allah will be generous with us. He will forgive us of our sins. He's very, very generous. But Allah is saying, no. And he, he is the most generous, despite that Allah is saying to you, what has deceived you about him? So therefore, they have no ground to stand on. They have no ground to stand on. <clears throat> and this shows you that uh, a, a very important point, a very, very important point. This shows you that a believer cannot use Allah's mercy and generosity as a justification to commit sin. Never. That should never be the case. And that in itself is a type of ghurur, a type of deception. So this is really the heart of the surah. Okay, and this is something that I want you to try and reflect on. We said that the first um, five verses, uh, this is essentially a summary of like the first 12 or 13 verses of Surah Al-Takweer, but that's really serving a muqaddi as, as an introduction really to this important verse. What has deceived you and lured you away from your Lord, the most generous? Now, um, firstly, just a few note points here. Al-Insan, um, Ya Ayyuhal Insan. Whenever this phrase, Ya Ayyuhal Insan, um, is mentioned in a Makki Surah, then in most cases, this is directed towards the Mushrikeen. Okay, so whenever you see the phrase, Ya Ayyuhal Insan, O oh Man, although this encompasses both the believers and disbelievers alike, but in Ghaliban, we say most cases, it really refers to um, the Mushrikeen. It really refers to the Mushrikeen. However, without a shadow of a doubt, we can also say this verse indirectly addresses the believers because sometimes believers are deceived by the, you know, by, by the, by, deceived into disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what has deceived them? from obeying their Lord. What has deceived them such that they, they go against the commandment of their Lord, the one who nurtured them, the one who provided them? Is it their ignorance or shaitan himself? And that's why in certain tafsir they say, what, the, what is the answer to this? What has deceived them? In many cases, it's their jahl. There are some reports that say it's their ignorance that has deceived them about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Others say shaitan. Another view is the fact that Allah didn't punish them straight away for their sin. And that what has deceived them. And this is a lesson that believer and disbeliever could take a lesson from. Okay? And you find this. You find like... Uh, with many animals, for example, if uh, um, uh, if you've ever tried to ca catch mice in your life, and use mouse traps, for example. Okay, I'm not issuing a fatwa saying is allowed to use mouse traps, but just I'm just saying. Now, with um, mouse traps, you find that certain mice they get very, very they're very very smart, and so what they do, they test the mouse trap out. Okay, so they'll move the the mouse trap, and they'll see it. Okay, that uh, you know. Okay, it will, it, you know, it will, uh, the trap will work and then they'll go for the cheese after that. So they're very, very smart. So what they do is, if they think they can get away with it, they'll approach it. And so what they'll do, if they see another trap, they're going to go to that trap again. And they'll take the cheese from it. But they don't realize that that trap is extremely, what, dangerous. 
And so the disbeliever or the sinner in this dunya, what he will do, he will commit the sin. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished people in different ways. In many cases he leaves the sin or the punishment to the hereafter. So the person who's anticipating a, a punishment, a sudden punishment, he's going to commit the sin and he will see, okay, nothing's happening to me, so it must be alright. Nothing's happening to me, it must be alright. And so he continues on. And that's why, what, what did the mushrikeen used to say? If what you say is true, let me bring on the punishment now, let's see it. And so what would they use as an argument for their rejection of faith? That we don't see anyone being punished. We don't see any thunderbolt striking idols and, you know, and what have you. We don't see any of that. So surely this it shouldn't be a major issue. And likewise the believer as well. He'll commit a sin and he won't see a sudden punishment. But that's because he's, he's been led astray and he doesn't realize how Allah, although yes, he can defer the punishment to the hereafter, but one of the major punishments in this dunya is what happens to his heart. His heart becomes very distant from Allah, but he cannot feel it. He becomes desensitized to committing sin. So he's thinking, okay, I'm committing these sins, nothing's really happening, oh, I can make tawbah later, but he doesn't realize his heart is just dying out. It's dying. Iman is being stripped away from him, but he can't sense it. The righteous of the pastor would sense it. You know, they would say, I used to see the ill effects of sins on my wife, my children, and my riding beast. They used to see the ill effects of their sins. In fact, when they would commit a sin, they would anticipate something to go wrong. They would anticipate it. They would think, okay, I've committed this sin. Astaghfirullah. Something is wrong going to happen today. That's how they used to be. But many of us, we commit sins and we just go on. We go on with our daily lives. Ma gharraka bi rabbikal kareem. What has deceived you? Don't allow this deferment of punishment to deceive you. And in fact, you know, subhanAllah, and this is the amazing how Allah, He defers the punishment as an act of mercy for the believers, but as a greater source of punishment for the disbelievers. Why is it a mercy for the believers? Because they have a chance to make tawbah. They have a chance to make tawbah. In fact, subhanAllah, look at this, when, when you do a good deed, what happens? The angels write it down straight away. When you commit a sin, the angels wait, subhanAllah. They don't write it down straight away. They wait for, for, for a period of time to see if you make tawbah. If you make tawbah, it's not going to be written down. That's from the mercy of Allah to defer that writing and to defer that punishment. For the disbeliever though, he's going to commit these crimes and he's thinking nothing's happening to me. But believe me, all of that will accumulate. But on the day of judgment, it will be a greater answer, you know, a greater uh, you know, test against him. And this really consoles the believer when he sees a lot of injustices and oppression being committed on this earth. When he sees that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given this person time. So like we're saying what's happening in Syria now, of course we want you know, the, 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 the suffering to, 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 to be removed straight away. But at the end of the day, these people will receive the exact punishment for their crimes on the day of judgment. And the longer it goes, the longer their punishment will be. And that will be shifa li sudur al mu'minin, and that will be a feeling of happiness for the believers when he knows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he does take these people, akhaza aziz muqtadir, it will be a taking of, uh, of the Almighty and the All Great. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to relieve the distresses of the Muslims in Syria and all around the Muslim world. Okay. Um, so, ma gharraka bi rabbikal kareem. So, this ayah essentially, as we just to reiterate, by Allah mentioning al kareem, it <coughs> denies them. It's an important point just to maybe conclude this point. It denies them uh, the chance to use Allah's generosity as an excuse. This verse it denies them to use Allah's generosity. As an excuse. Because as I said, if, we, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had said, what has fooled you or what has deceived you about, the, you know, you, about your Lord, the Almighty, then they could say, well, Allah's generosity. But they can't now because Allah has established this here already. So they have no way out therefore. 
Now, um, an important lesson we can take from this, brothers and sisters, is that when a person therefore truly understands the generosity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this should necessitate that person being grateful towards Allah and worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at the argument here. What has deceived you? What does it mean what has deceived you? Meaning what has led you into kufr and disbelief and disobedience to Allah? Whilst your Lord is the most generous. Implying what? That if your Lord is the Al-Kareem, if He is the most generous, what should that make you do? Worship Him and be grateful towards Him. And so the lesson is, Ma'rifatul Al-Karam, that knowledge of Allah's generosity should lead the person to be grateful towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not to take advantage of his generosity or fall short in fulfilling his rights. Now, <clears throat> what are the pillars of gratitude? Those who studied the 40 hadith <coughs> with me, what, was the, what are the three pillars of gratitude? What was the first pillar of gratitude? Ahsan. Internal recognition of the blessing that Allah has bestowed upon you. And we can see this in this ayah. Meaning Allah is saying, if your Lord is generous to you, and He is your, and notice this, ma <coughs> gharraka. He said, Bi Rabbika. He didn't say, Ma gharraka bi ilahika, by your, what has um, uh, deceived you about your, your, your Creator. No, Bi Rabbika. And Rabb, <coughs> nurturing, taking care of, providing. All those connotations are contained within that word, Rabb. So, knowledge of Allah's bounty, it necessarily leads to you being grateful towards Allah subhanahu wa Second pillar of gratitude to thank Allah upon the tongue. Okay, and thirdly, this is also implied in this verse to use the ni'mah to obey Allah. Because remember, we said, What does it mean? I mean, what has deceived you such that you are now disobeying Allah? Despite the fact that he is kareem towards you. He is kareem towards you. So why are you disobeying him? Implying what? If Allah is kareem to you, you should be obeying him. So we can see here the pillars, the major pillars of gratitude uh, within, this, within this ayah. That's a very, very important lesson. From this verse. And then Allah mentions in verse 7. A clarification of uh, a clarification of um, uh, uh, maybe before we mention that actually there's a narration of Ibn Mas'ud that Imam Al-Qurtubi mentions and some attribute this to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam مَا مِنْكُمْ أَحَدٍ إِلَّا سَيَخْلُوا اللَّهُ لَهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ There is no one amongst you except that Allah will have a private conversation with him فَيَقُولُ لَهُ And so Allah will say to him, يَا إِبْنَ آدَمْ مَاذَا غَرَّكَ بِي O oh, son of Adam, what had, what had deceived you about me? What was it? Was it ignorance? Was it shaitan? But I gave you everything. I gave you knowledge. I gave you protection from shaitan. مَاذَا عَمِلْتَ بِمَا عَلِمْتَ What did you act upon in relation to your knowledge? That knowledge you had, how did you act upon that knowledge? ماذا أجبت المرسلين؟ يا ابن آدم ماذا أجبت المرسلين؟ O son of Adam, how did you respond to the messengers? You will be asked these questions. <coughs> verse number 7, going back to verse number 7, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and this is the clarification of a part of Allah's karam, of His generosity. الذي خلقك فسواك فعدلك the one who created you, خلقك, the one who created you, فسواك, and he shaped you and proportioned you, فعدلك, 
and he balanced you in another qira'ah uh, fa'addalaka uva shadda on the, the dal that's another qira'ah so this is a manifest Allah first he created you he is the one who created you sawaka sawa this is the verb sawa yusawi sawi taswiyah a taswiyah the act of um, uh, proportioning the person meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, made him قويما سليما قويم and سليم meaning he's sound in his form every human being for example is generally created with a head with limbs okay with organs this was the, the, the general reality of man and then after Allah gave you and he proportioned you like this he balanced you Meaning that those limbs that you have, فَعَدَلَكَ They are proportional to one another. For example, our, our arms are generally both the same length. Our feet are generally both the same length as well. We have two hands that are the same. We have two eyes, symmetrical. Everything is symmetrical. And that's one way some scholars interpret it, that there's this uh, symmetry with our creation. One half is the same as the other half generally. That's how Allah created. Now, for some people though, obviously this is this perfect balance is not there. Sometimes people are born deformed. Sometimes people are formed in with disabilities. So people could say, how can that be the case when Allah says, Allah bi khalaqaka fa sawaka fa adalak? Allah, when we say when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions these realities, this is according to what is predominantly the case. Whatever Allah does is for a wisdom. And sometimes human beings need to be shown something which is out of the norm so that they can appreciate what they already have. For many people, when they see disabilities, what do they do? They praise Allah, isn't it? They praise Allah for what they have. If everyone was rich, for example, and there was no poor person upon this earth, you'll find people being very ungrateful towards Allah. They'll be very, they'll be very angry because they think, look, everyone's wealthy. This is the norm. But when they see a poor person, they think, Subhanallah, look how much I have. And a person, for an individual, though, when they their child, for example, is born with a disability, they, they might just see it within that context, my child. But no, this is a child, which is amongst the human race. And so as a result, when people around the world, they know of disabilities, they know of these imperfections, so-called imperfections, they appreciate the great creation of Allah. They truly appreciate it. Because how could billions of people be born in this amazing manner? Two eyes, two ears, is exactly the same. Fingerprints which are exactly the same. We can walk in this balanced way. Generally, we can. We are. We have straight backs, and this is amazing. Subhanallah. All from what? A drop of sperm and an egg. You know, if surely this world was created by chance, people would be giving birth to monsters and various different types of creatures. But no, this is a a planning that is taking place, and so that's why. You say, matters are known by their opposites. Matters are known by their opposites. Allah says, for some people he gives children, for other people he makes them aqim, infertile. They don't give birth. When people see that, they say, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah for providing me with children. When there are people out there that can't even conceive. So we need to under, you know, bring ourselves out of this bubble of our own lives and understand we are human beings amongst a whole race, a whole nation. Verse 8, That when Allah He creates and He shapes and He, and, and he balances us, He creates us فِي In whichever fashion, in whichever image that Allah wills. Some scholars interpret this to mean, how will this person look? 
Will this person look like their father? Will this person look like their father? Will this person look like their mother, their uncle, their auntie? And this is something, subhanAllah. Now imagine, brothers, if I was to stick up my hand now and you were to look at my hand, and I was to, you know, and somebody else's hand came up, you probably couldn't tell the difference, maybe. If you saw my face, though, for the similar amount of time, you would recognize that face. It's amazing. Don't you think it's amazing how we all are born with arms and legs that are all very similar to all other human beings? We can't tell the difference between our, our feet and our hands, okay, amongst ourselves. But faces we can. Faces we can, subhanAllah. The face is the most distinguished feature to the extent, I mean, there are probably billions of hands in the world that resemble my hand. But how many faces are there that resemble our own face? Subhanallah. That's just amazing, you know. There are sometimes you find human beings, they look like one another. Okay, I can see brothers here that look like other people I know, but, you know. But you can still tell the difference. But, you know, things like hands and legs, you know, Subhanallah. Fi ayya suratin, ma sha'a In any image that Allah wills. This, all of this is said in a context. These two verses are said in a context to make the person realize how much Allah has been generous with them. This is Allah's karam, Allah's generosity towards you. When you were nurtured in your womb, you couldn't feel any pain, you didn't feel any hunger, you didn't feel any thirst. Allah was providing for you day and night without any human influence whatsoever. Any human influence whatsoever. And that's why really it's, it's amazing that you know, Rasulullah used to make the beautiful dua Allahumma kama hassanta khalqi fa hassin khuluqi. Or another riwayah, Allahumma kama ahsanta khalqi fa ahsin khuluqi. What a beautiful dua. Oh Allah, just as you have perfected my physical creation, my khalq, then perfect my khuluq, then perfect my manners and characteristics. And this is why, brothers, it's very important that we never uh, belittle the physical creation of man. Even if he be a disbeliever, and this is something really I find very upsetting that you, you find brothers, for example, if they see someone, a kafir, who looks like, you know, he has some odd features, natural odd features, they'll start insulting him and they say, oh, he looks like a monkey, or he looks like this, or he looks like that. This is khalqullah. This is the creation of Allah. How can you belittle the creation of Allah? Obviously, if they've done things to their own bodies, then fine, you can laugh at them. Okay? And this is crazy. This is what was happening to the plastic surgery and what have you. But if that's the natural creation of Allah, don't criticize it. If Rasulullah wouldn't even criticize the taste of food, how can we criticize, subhanAllah, this amazing creation, this physical being? And so really, we have to reflect upon that. And realize this is an amazing creation of Allah. This human body, amazing creation uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By the way, that dua is reported in some books of hadith. It's recommended to say this dua when you look in the mirror. When you look in the mirror, they say it's good to say this dua. But some scholars say this hadith is da'if. But as for the dua itself, then it's established dua, inshaAllah. Um, but as I said, to say when looking in the, in the mirror in particular, uh, any, some say that hadith is da'if. I've taken enough of your time, so I'll stop there, inshallah. And again, I apologize for the late start.